Good morning, we have 10 o'clock, so we're going to get our webinar started. I'd like to welcome you to this morning's webinar on flagging basics for a two-lane road. This is Victoria Veal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and we're pleased today to have one of our own presenting on the webinar, Ray Brushhart, who's our work zone safety circuit writer. Um, before we get things started, though, and I turn it over to Ray, just a couple of housekeeping items. First off, we are attempting to record the webinar. If we're successful, we'll send a link out to everyone afterwards. Um, secondly, you have joined the webinar in a muted stage, meaning that your microphone that if you have through your computer is muted or if you've joined us to the phone line that that has been muted as well. Um, what we'd like for you to do while Ray is presenting if you have questions is to please enter those in the chat pod. Now hopefully you see a chat pod on the bottom left hand side of your screen. It actually says like conversation at the top of it. If you don't see that you should see a circle with a thought bubble in it. Click on it and that will display the chat pod for you. Um, on the left hand side of the screen. So I'm hoping that you have your chat pod open now and if you um, haven't joined through the audio through the computer there is information in the chat pod about how to call into the audio. So I believe that's all of our housekeeping items, Ray. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you for the, the webinar. Um, and again, at the end of the webinar, if we have time, we'll open the phone lines for audio questions. But please put your questions in the chat pod for Ray, and I'll read those off to him while he's presenting and get responses for you. You ready, Ray? Yes, I am. OK, all yours. OK, thank you, Victoria. Well, good morning, everybody. How is everybody today? I hope. Uh, having a good morning. Uh, we're here today to talk about the basics of uh, flagging on a, a two-lane road and uh, we want to focus in on uh, you know all the requirements from signage to uh, you know how to um, uh, control traffic with your hand signals and the stop slow paddle and uh, we'll go over some considerations for um, yeah, you know, sight distance and how to accommodate things like when you have roads with uh, hills and curves and things like that. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. The uh, objectives of today's webinar is, uh, you know, we want you guys to, after this to have a basic understanding of a flagger's qualifications and responsibilities, along with uh, knowing the necessary equipment and clothing, and uh, hopefully you'll realize the importance of proper flagging procedures and the, the signs that are needed and uh, flagger stations. And uh, we're also going to be going over uniform flagging procedures and how they are applied depending on the type of operation being performed. Uh, we want all flaggers to uh, display the same flagging procedures. Uh, that way when uh, no matter where a motorist is driving and they come up on a flagging operation that they'll um, you know, they'll see the flaggers using the same hand signals and, and all of that. That way uh, they'll have a better understanding of what's going on and, and make it makes the flagging operation safer. Uh, also, uh, we'll talk about the development of safety habits to maintain safe working conditions for employees and motorists around and through your work areas. Okay, so uh, Let's go ahead and get started with a uh, part one of the webinar, Flagging Overview. Uh, in this part one, we'll go over the proper clothing and equipment you need to be a flagger, uh, the types of flagger operations, uh, hand signals and flagging devices, proper flagging procedures. Uh, we'll take a look at the signs that are needed for your flagging operation and how to space them properly and uh, the proper flagging location where the flagger needs to stand as they flag. And so uh, a little bit about traffic flagging. Flag flaggers are critical to traffic safety. The consequences of improper flagging may be severe and the flaggers have very important responsibilities. Uh, it's important that everybody knows that um, you know, a flagging operation is derived from the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, or the OMUTCD, and you can find um, 
in the flagging typical application in part six of the OMUTCD. Uh, part six is also called the temporary traffic control. It's important that all agencies in Ohio have a copy of the OMUTCD and uh, of course also part six. If you uh, don't have copies of that, you can let us know here at LTAP and we'll make sure you get a copy. And we'll also teach you how to find it online as well through the ODOT website. And uh, typical application number 10 is what, what the flagging operation is based upon. And it's titled lane closure on a two lane road using flaggers. So who all depends on the flagger? There's lots of people depend on the flagger, from the workers to the motorists, pedestrians, people on bicycles, children, infrastructure depends on it as well. Of course, the flagger, him or herself, depends on uh, them doing the job properly. So we want to make sure that you follow standard and uniform flagging procedures. When we do this, we increase motorist respect. We promote a uniform response from the motorists, and we minimize driver's confusion. There we have a picture of a, a lady flagging, but uh, you can see the her flagging symbol sign is uh, behind her. You know, that's not the place where we want that sign to be, right? We want that sign to be well in advance of the flagger, so the, the motorist is looking for the flagger. A, a flagger must uh, meet certain qualifications. Not just anybody can be a flagger. Flaggers need to demonstrate a sense of responsibility. Uh, they need to have adequate training and safe temporary traffic control procedures. They need to be in good physical condition, uh, possess mental alertness, be courteous but firm, and uh, also have a neat appearance. Uh, they must stay alert at all times and face oncoming traffic, be highly visible, stay on the shoulder of the road out of the path of vehicles, which is very important. They need to relay information to the motorist and uh, use common sense. If you have any questions or you don't feel safe, you need to contact your supervisor and discuss that. So, some responsibilities of a flagger. A flagger is responsible for his or her own safety and the safety of other workers, the safety of the driving public. So, flaggers definitely need to know how to do their job correctly. Now, let's take a look at, at a flagging operation from the standpoint of the drivers, the motorists. What is their experience as they approach your flagging operation? So, as you all know, drivers can be uh, tired or they're preoccupied or worried about other things. Uh, we must get their attention. It's important that the flagger uh, make eye contact with the approaching motorist. And uh, so we can guide them through the work zone safely and protect your fellow workers. And controlling drivers, no one says it was easy. Uh, drivers, they want to make their own decisions. They like to be in control. And, uh, of course, they have expectations. and They're all on a schedule. Today's motorists are more in a hurry than ever before, it seems like. Um, but work zones are prone, are more prone to accidents. Um, you know, today's day and age of distracted driving, uh, when drivers are approaching a work zone, it's not business as usual. Uh, most of the time you're working in an area where motorists usually are going the speed limit. And so, uh, you know, we need to do our best to uh, alert them that there is a work zone. We need to control them uh, as they drive, as they approach and drive through the work zone. And, of course, they think that you are in their way. They don't really want to stop, do they? And there are some factors that affect driver's ability. And uh, it could be the road itself. You know, it might be a weather condition, uh, rain or snow or ice. Uh, some drivers, of course, can be under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Uh, maybe the driver's age has something to do with their ability, whether they be a, a new driver, uh, 16 years old, uh, all the way up to uh, it might be uh, a senior citizen 
uh, doesn't have the best eyesight or reflexes, uh, driver's experience, uh, weather, and of course, people are, are all, almost always on cell phones these days, aren't they? So you, you never assume a driver sees you. That's why it's so important to try your best to establish eye contact with that motorist as soon as possible. Here's a picture of a guy uh, that says, is flagger training needed? Well, let's see. He's definitely sitting down in the shade. That's probably not the uh, best place for him to be. He should definitely not be sitting down. Uh, here's a picture of a, a flagger with their back turned to traffic, and they're standing in the middle of the road. Um, also, I don't see any cones. I see a, a vehicle truck. Uh, a, a truck parked on the side of the road there that shouldn't be there we, we're also going to learn that the, the sign they have there is not up to date we we no longer want you to use the sign that says flagger ahead we want you to use the flagger symbol sign now so flagger control uh, the the ohio manual of uniform traffic control devices part six states that when operations are such that signs, signals, and barricades do not provide the necessary protection on or adjacent to a highway street, flaggers or other appropriate traffic controls shall be provided. And signaling directions by flaggers shall conform to the OMUTCD. So there's an entire section in uh, the Temporary Traffic Control Manual about the proper signaling directions for flaggers. Okay, so that's a, a lot of general information there about flagging. So now we're going to move on to our next section, part two. It's, it's titled the ABCs of flagging. So uh, if you can remember ABC, you're going to remember uh, the basic elements of flagging. So let's see what I'm talking about. So A is for awareness. B is for be visible and alert, and C is for communication, or it also could be control. So, so these are the essential aspects of any flagging operation. So let's talk about A for advanced warning. The advanced warning area of your flagging operation is where your traffic to your temporary traffic control signs are located. So. Uh, these signs lets the public know that you are there, you're working. They need to know that well in advance. And these signs need to be in place before you start the flagging operation. So uh, here are your um, warning signs you need to be in place. So the first sign the motorist sees is going to be the road work ahead sign. And then the second sign is going to say one lane road ahead. And uh, that tells the motorist uh, what the situation is that lies ahead. So we're telling them there's only one lane open ahead. And then the third sign is the flagger symbol sign. So they need to uh, be told that there's a flagger ahead that's going to tell them what to do. They need to be aware of that, be prepared to do what the flagger says. And here at ODOT, you know, we have our 55 mile per hour state routes that are two lanes. And uh, we actually have a fourth sign that we use. And that sign says, be prepared to stop. So um, it's listed as an option in the typical application. So, um, you know, at ODOT, with high-speed traffic, uh, we want to use all the options that we can. And so it's, it's quite easy to have that fourth sign that says, be prepared to stop. It really adds safety, and it really um, has an effect on the motorists because it, it really tells them, uh, that they're, they might actually have to stop, so be prepared to stop. <clears throat> uh, another <clears throat> method used to draw attention to the signs is we'd like for you to place one of your newer cones, nice and shiny, with two bands of retro reflectivity. Place it right beside your sign. Um, that way it helps it stand out even more. So here's the road work ahead sign. It's the first advance warning sign in that uh, three sign series. So it says, uh, so on high speed road, uh, this sign would be placed 1500 feet before the flagger station. And uh, that's for high speed rural roadways that, with the 500 foot spacing. But not all of you guys on the webinar today work for um, 
an agency that has high speed two lane roads. Maybe you work for a city or a village where you have lower speed roads. And so this chart is in the manual. And so as you can see, if uh, uh, maybe you have a 35 mile per hour speed limit or 25, and as you can see, the distances A, B, and C uh, for low speed would be 100 feet apart. And then um, if you're in an urban location where the speed limit is 45 or higher, uh, then you can go 350 feet apart. But definitely on our two-lane rural roads with high speeds, we want those signs to be 500 feet apart. So the next sign then is the one-lane road ahead sign. And uh, so this, as I said before, it's a second sign. So it, the second sign, it's always used to let the motorists know what the situation is that lies ahead. And then the third sign is the flag or symbol sign. So this uh, on the high speed two lane rural roads are 500 feet in front of the flagger. So here's a picture of a, the signs in place this is obviously a lower speed situation where the signs, uh, they must be 100 feet apart there. So is the spacing important for these signs? Yes, it is. And uh, it gives the motorist, uh, at the speed they're traveling, it gives them time to read and comprehend each sign as they approach. So let's talk a little bit about how you go about setting up your signs before you start flagging. So when you're setting up signs, you're going to set up your, you'll start uh, with the signs that are furthest from the work area. So you'll start with your very first sign. So that's the uh, road work ahead sign, and you'll install them with the flow of traffic. And uh, it's important to know that as you're setting up signs, that you're actually a mobile operation at that point. So you need to follow the, the standards for mobile operation. So you need to have your high intensity strobes turned on. If you have a light bar across the top of your vehicle, you should have it on as well. Because at ODOT, we have a 360 degree view of our uh, lighting package for our work trucks. And so, uh, you know, the more lights you have, the better. But you, you are required to have your high intensity strobes turned on, not just your tailgate warning flashing lights. They have to be the high intensity LED uh, strobes. <clears throat> so um, the cones that you lay out after the signs, they have requirements as well as far as spacing. So this table you see there is, uh, is also in the OMUTCD. It talks about the spacing of your channelizing devices, or, you know, which are your cones or drums, whichever you use. So today we're talking about two-lane roads. So on a two-lane road, in the taper, uh, the cones are closer together than anywhere else. And so they have a maximum spacing of 20 feet. And so, uh, you know, you can put them closer together. You can put them side by side if you want, but the maximum spacing is 20 feet apart. And then as you get past the taper uh, in the buffer and workspace, then the maximum spacing is two times the speed limit. So uh, again, uh, you know, it might, might be 110 feet for 55 miles per hour. And uh, again, that's maximum spacing. You can put them closer together if you desire. Um, a little bit more about uh, the length of your taper on a two lane road. As you can see on the in the second column in this table, it says two lanes. So um, uh, when you look under in that second column, you see uh, the length of that taper is a 50 foot minimum to 100 foot maximum, no matter what the speed is. And so that's the idea with, uh, with the taper and a flagging operation. We want it to be a short taper and uh, the cones are closer together. And so it looks like a as the motorist approaches you, it appears to be a wall of cones across their lane. And it really makes them slow down when they see that. So here's a drawing showing a uh, um, 
what your flagging operation looks like on your two-lane road. And we're talking about setting up your signs still. So uh, it says first place advanced warning signs in the unaffected lane and then the closed lane. So um, you're going to have signs in each direction, remember, on this two-lane road. So it's, you're going to put the, uh, lane, the signs out in the unaffected lane first, again, with the flow of traffic. And then you'll come around and put in the signs, again, with the flow of traffic in the affected lane there. And then when it comes time to remove your signs and cones, you're going to remove them in the opposite way. So you'll be against the flow of traffic. So it says when your signs are no longer needed, you either lay the devices down or place at a 9 degree angle to the traffic, even for short periods, including lunchtime. So if uh, when you go to lunch and your signs are up, we want you to lay your signs down because um, we never want to uh, have motorists see a flag or symbol sign when there's no flagger ahead because uh, motorists would lose respect for that sign uh, when no workers are present and this may influence their behavior in the future. So that's important. So it says we're going to remove the channelizing devices against the flow of traffic and then uh, remove the, so then your signs are the last thing to go down. So your, the last sign removed was the first sign installed. So that was the A in the ABC, so let's now move on to the B. The B stands for Be Visible and Alert. So uh, we want to make sure the public sees you and that you have the proper clothing and equipment. ODOT requires all employees to wear, a, uh, it says lime green, it's called fluorescent yellow green safety vest uh, that meets the ANSI standard uh, 107 dash I believe that's been updated now to, I think, 2004 when you're flagging. So you've got to have that Class 2 vest on during the day. It's actually Class 3 if you're uh, flagging at night. So his slide says, is the flagger visible? Well, he's not very visible at all, is he? He's standing uh, two vehicles away behind a work truck, and he's got the stop-slow paddle jammed down into a an old cone and right up against a truck. So uh, that is definitely not the proper way to do that. I think he got uh, uh, some time off for that uh, setup. Okay, let's move on to our uh, the clothing that you wear so that you can uh, be visible. So it's uh, you got your fluorescent yellow green vest on. Um, what else it says? A fluorescent version of these colors. At ODOT, we require our flyers to wear hard hats. I guess uh, each agency has their own uh, uh, standards for that. And uh, it says retro reflective for nighttime flagging. So that's why you got to have the Class 3 vest, and that includes the pants if you're flagging at night. Let's take a look at the stop slope paddle. Um, everyone needs to have this uh, stop slope paddle. So it's got the uh, the red sign with the white stop legend. Uh, the slow is the black legend on orange background. Retro reflectorized for night use. It says at least 18 by 18. I actually uh, would recommend you use the 24 by 24, especially if you're on a high speed road. It says larger for added visibility. And the stop slow paddles on a uh, your post is five foot to seven foot high with a rigid handle. Okay, let's take a look at uh, some flagging equipment here. Each flagger should have uh, the standard stop slow paddle. Uh, you might have red flags if it's an emergency situation. Uh, we'd like for you to have an air horn or a, a really good whistle to warn your fellow workers if somebody uh, doesn't stop and you want them to stop two-way radio, pad and pencil, maybe you want to write down somebody's license plate or something. There's also personal comfort items such as sunglasses, uh, plenty of drinking water, rain gear, and sunscreen. Now let's talk about the preferred flagger location. 
uh, says you should never stand in the path of moving vehicles. You should be on the shoulder of the road at the beginning of your cone taper. Does this uh, flagger look to be standing in the proper location? Uh, we don't think so. We think he should be uh, standing more on the shoulder of the road. He's kind of he's in the lane of traffic at that point. Okay, so the taper again is 50 foot to 100 feet long when you're having a lane closure, and uh, we'd like to see six devices uh, in your cone taper. Six cones. Next comes the buffer space. So the buffer space is a safety option in a flagging operation. And um, the length of it is based upon the approach speed and road conditions. Uh, might have something to do with sight distance as well if you're dealing with curves and hills. So it gives the motorist, the errant motorist, the proper amount of distance to be able to come to a stop if they were surprised. Uh, by your flagging operation. Maybe they were distracted or something. So it's an empty space with no people or vehicles or equipment. So it's just there for the errant motors to come to a stop. So here are the recommended buffer space distances. So if you're in a, a village or a city with 35 mile per hour speed and you'd want that to be 120 feet long, And uh, at 55 miles per hour, it could be 335 feet long. And uh, I've seen uh, recommended buffer spaces longer than this as well. It's usually based on stop distance, stopping sight distance. So it could be uh, for 35, could be 250 feet. And for 55, could be up to 495 feet. So it's a judgment call for you guys. And you know, maybe these are the summer distances where you have, it's not raining or snowing. But, uh, you know, uh, the point of the matter is that we don't want to see a flagger standing right beside where the work is taking place. You need some distance there uh, for safety. You don't, you, you don't want to be in a position where you are, you're leaving no room for error. That, uh, that's not a good move. So it says here that uh, the, the buffer space separates the flagger from the workers. <clears throat> Again, it allows the motorist room to stop before entering the work area, give workers a few extra seconds to react uh, before an errant vehicle enters the work area. And if there are curves or hills in the road, the flagger station should be extended to allow additional stopping time. So here's a picture of a... Uh, your flagging operation on this two-lane road. It uh, clearly shows the, uh, the uh, where the flagger is standing along with the, uh, the signage, the transition area, the buffer space, the workspace, and the downstream taper. <clears throat> and then here's a, a picture uh, that's showing a curve in the road. And this is very important to uh, see that in, when there's a curve or a hill, the flagger is standing uh, back in the straight section of the road before the curve. And all the signs are in the straight section before the curve. And what they've done is extend the buffer area uh, instead of allowing the flagger to stand just around that curve where there wouldn't be enough sight distance for the motors to see them. Okay, let's move on to the C. It could be communication. I've also seen it uh, stand for control. So it's important to remember that flagger is considered a legal traffic control device, and he or she must be obeyed. And so there's three basic flagging skills that each flagger uh, must learn. So the, that's stopping traffic, releasing traffic, and slowing traffic. So we want all flaggers to use the standard signals um, for stopping and releasing and slowing traffic. And so to stop traffic, you need to be, again, on the shoulder of the road at the beginning of the taper. You've got your right arm extended out uh, with the stop uh, part of the sign showing to the motorist. And you've got your uh, left hand facing out, your palm facing out towards the motorist. 
And then when you release and slow traffic, uh, you're going to use the slow part of the sign. Um, you don't want to wave the sign. You know, the, the sign will still be held still. And then you're going to uh, use your left arm uh, either in a sweeping motion to uh, release them or go up and down to slow traffic. Okay, so get your palm out facing traffic. Make, oh, that's right. Don't ever forget to make eye contact with that motorist. Okay, so after you have some a uh, vehicle stopped, especially if it's a, a larger vehicle, you know, you might have a minivan or an SUV or a pickup truck or an 18-wheeler, and then you've got normal-sized cars coming behind them. Uh, what you can do is, uh, once those the first vehicle stopped, you can walk out uh, by the center line. You don't want to cross the center line, though, because remember, now you're going to have <clears throat> vehicles coming from the other direction. So you got to be aware of those vehicles coming from behind you. And uh, you can, the point of this is that you can show your stop sign to the approaching uh, vehicle so they can see why that first larger vehicle is stopped. Okay, so to release traffic, you're, you you got to get back to the shoulder and then put your sign on slow. <clears throat> Make sure you got your eye contact with the drivers and you're using your free hand to direct uh, drivers to the proper lane. You're going to sweep with your your left hand. And again, you're not going to wave the sign that could confuse motorists. So when you're slowing traffic, you know, as they're approaching traffic, uh, they might be arriving too fast and you want to slow them down. So uh, you won't necessarily have to stop them, but you can slow them and you use your free arm to motion traffic to slow down and by uh, waving up and down uh, with your hand. Okay, so that's the ABCs of flagging. Now let's take a look at uh, different types of flagger operations. So ODOT's most common flagging operation is the, the two-flagger method. And uh, so communication and teamwork is essential. Uh, typically one flagger is in charge, and the lead flagger should be in the closed lane, as you can see there. So uh, the first flagger, uh, it's going to release traffic by displaying slow, and then the second flagger stops traffic by displaying stop, and they're going to continue to stop traffic until the all clear signal is received from the first flagger. And then uh, releases traffic while the first flagger stops traffic. So here's the detail that you see in the temporary traffic control manual. So this is typical application number 10. And uh, so it clearly shows exactly what signs to use. And uh, the spacing of the signs is denoted as A, B, and C, just like in your sign spacing chart we looked at earlier. It shows where the flag is standing. It shows the taper, the buffer space. And uh, there's uh, two ways that uh, the two flaggers can communicate. One is uh, the sight method. When you both have visual contact with each other, you're able to see each other. So the lead flagger should establish which signals are to be used by the team prior to the shift. And then if you can't see each other, then you have the two-way radios uh, to communicate with. So this is the most common. Uh, so it's needed when you're, you can't see each other, maybe even when there's multiple flaggers. So sometimes you need more than two flaggers when you have maybe other intersections or busy driveways in between the, the two flaggers. So it's important that you have fully charged batteries at the beginning of your shift. We also have a, another kind called the flag, flag carrying method. So uh, this is a last resort. So this is where the, uh, the first flagger hands a flag to the last car that's allowed to pass. And then that driver hands the flag to the second flagger at the other end of the job. And uh, so that's the all clear signal. So that second flagger can then release traffic from their end, and then hand um, the flag to the last person in that uh, platoon. We also have an advanced flagger situation. Um, 
So this is a situation where you, you might have to stop each vehicle and uh, let them know that there's a, a situation ahead and tell them what that is, what to expect, give them instructions. And again, you need to be alert and considerate. Try to avoid unnecessary conversations. Then we have a single flagger operation. Sometimes it only takes one flagger to do the job, but uh, you have to meet uh, certain conditions for this. So it's got to be a low volume road with good visibility in each direction. Uh, it's a short workspace, uh, kind of like uh, you know a lot of utility workers face. They have short workspaces. And this would be a, a short duration job. That means less than one hour and in low speed. So that would be uh, where it would be under 40 miles per hour. So with a single flagger operation, you're standing directly across from the workspace and you're controlling traffic in both directions. So here's a picture of a, a single flagger operation. So uh, you can see he's standing uh, directly across from the work area. He's got a couple of cones at his feet to help him stand out more. So it's important to be visible to traffic coming from both directions. If you can't be visible in both directions, then you need to use two flaggers. So you should never step into traffic if you're the single flagger, always on the shoulder. Then we have our nighttime flagging operation. So these are generally the, using the same techniques and all, but you're going to have some equipment changes. You're going to use a flashlight with a glow cone, uh, your vest, and uh, it's actually going to be a class three vest, which has more retro reflectivity. Uh, you'd even have some trousers to match the vest. And your paddle must be retro reflectorized. And you're also required to have auxiliary lighting on the flagger station. So this is not headlights from a truck. It's actually a light that shines down on the flagger. And then here we have part four. It says flagging during emergency. So what do you do if a, an emergency squad arrives uh, at your flagging uh, station? So um, also it has to deal with uh, the work that you're conducting is that uh, emergency work like a water main break or maybe you need to flag for some sort of uh, an accident or crash that happened so in these situations you're allowed to use a flag instead of the stop slow paddle because you might not have the stop slow paddle with you at that time so your flag must be a minimum of 24 inches square in red in color and it must be weighted on one end to keep the flag from blowing in high winds and uh, we want you to use a paddle as soon as it becomes available though so then it, when emergency vehicles show up uh, you want to allow them the right of way as soon as possible however there are times where it might not be safe for them to go so uh, you know you, you actually might have to stop them if that is the case so uh, you want to consider that as you're the flagger. So handling emergency situations, uh, it says to anticipate the unexpected, be prepared to respond, and protect yourself. You know, that also goes, even if it's not an emergency situation, you you got to think of a, you know, what will you do if a, if a car is coming right at you? You've got to have an emergency uh, exit plan to where are you going to jump to um, also it's important to warn other flaggers and workers uh, that's why we want you to have a, a an air horn or a, a referee's whistle so if someone does not obey you we want you uh, do your best to record description of the card or license plate number because you know, they broke the law and uh, they need to be accountable for that. Okay, it says notify your supervisor. So do these things in this order. So there's the types of emergencies you might face might be drivers disobeying your command and or crashes and accidents. So handling crashes, uh, you know, try to make sure you notify your supervisor is aware so they could call for help but you still need to 
continue to control traffic and stay in contact with the other flaggers. Here's another thing, handling hostile drivers. Uh, a lot of times drivers are in a hurry. They really get uh, upset when they're stopped. But it's important that uh, you stay in command. Uh, do not abandon your post. Be polite but brief. Keep a safe distance. Be courteous but firm. So let's uh, remember that flagging is an important job. You need to stay alert, face oncoming traffic, be visible, and you'll be standing alone, remember, on the shoulder of the road well in advance of the work area. Be courteous, use common sense, remember the ABCs of flagging, awareness, be visible, communication or control. So that is our uh, our presentation on uh, today's uh, flagging operation. So uh, I hope this is helpful. I think we've got some time for questions. Ray, we, you've done a great job because we haven't gotten any questions in the chat pod. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and open the phone lines up now. So if you have a party going on in the background, make sure you tell them to hold it down. Um, but that way you can ask questions over the phone lines if you have any. So I found a way to unmute everybody at once. So get ready. Okay, everybody's been unmuted. Um, it looks like I have to go through and unmute you each individually too now though. So I'll just start at the top and start working my way down here. I'm good. All right, I'm up to Greg Jones. Good. So um, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them. I think I've just got three more folks to unmute. Okay, everyone's unmuted. So if you have questions you'd like to ask of Ray, please go ahead and ask them. Going once, twice. Okay, sounds good then. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us for the webinar this morning. Um, we will be sending out a link to the recording if the recording was successful. And Ray, thank you for all your hard work on putting this together and providing the webinar. So, And if you have any questions for Ray, um, his contact information was on the last slide. Please feel free to reach out and join him. But thanks again for joining the webinar today. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.